All right. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for joining us today. Um, this is Brad Harder with One Market Data. And I uh, just want to thanks, thank everybody for uh, registering and uh, signing on. Um, just to review a few things uh, as far as housekeeping items, um, we will be having a Q&A session at the end, so please uh, save those for the end of the webinar. Uh, if you look to your right of the, of the webinar, there's a section in there where it, the, the Q&A section is, and you can type in your questions, and um, we'll diligently uh, answer those questions at the end, and I'll, I'll prompt everybody uh, when that time is. Um, as far as uh, everyone is on mute, so just uh, keep And just uh, let's see, go on to the uh, the speakers today. Uh, Louis Lobos, uh, the director of solutions at One Market Data, uh, where his responsibilities include strategic business development and delivered target solutions for quantitative research. Uh, David Don, CIO uh, and head of algorithmic trading at RCM, um, where he manages the development of execution algorithms for equities and future products. So I think we have a couple of really good speakers for you guys today. Um, just as far as a, from an agenda perspective, um, we're looking at David uh, will start things off for execution algos for the futures market. And Louis will do the TCA, what it, what it is and why it's important. Uh, again, we'll have Q&A uh, at the end um, and then we will, we will conclude from there. Um, just as far as a description uh, in regards to in what we're going to cover today in this webinar, we're going to discuss the techniques to optimize your trading and futures markets, um, increasing competition, thinning margins, and new best practice regulations has heightened sensitivity to trading costs. The chief tool firms are using to, using to meet these challenges has become automated execution algorithms. The goal of execution algorithms is to protect alpha by avoiding crossing the spread as much as possible while working to blend in with other participants' activity. Transaction cost analysis is intended to provide a number of quantifiable objectives to quantify execution performances, looking at efficiencies by measuring and monitoring execution against benchmarks. So with that said, uh, we'll, we'll get started here with David. And give me a second. Give us a second, one second, just having more technical difficulties. All right, David. Hi, uh, good morning. This is David Dunn with RCMX. And uh, RCMX is a financial technology firm that uh, designs benchmark execution algorithms and also helps customize those algorithms to meet our clients' needs. And uh, we also license out a piece of technology strategy studio uh, for systematic firms that are looking to implement automated trading strategies and a uh, low latency environment using a consistent platform for back testing through production trading. And it's actually the same software that we use behind the scenes to implement our benchmark execution algorithms. So uh, today we wanted to give an overview of execution algorithms, some insights into how they work and how to combine those insights with performance measurement to help optimize execution over time. 
first of all, uh, just a general statement on why to use execution algorithms and uh, why it's important to do that. So execution algorithms offer three uh, key advantages over uh, traditional uh, manual trading. One is uh, uh, convenience, another is performance, and another is repeatability. By using an execution algorithm, you free uh, your traders to uh, monitor a larger set of flow without constantly uh, interacting with the market and working in order. And uh, by using a technology to execute your flow, you're competing better with the uh, systematic and high-frequency uh, market makers that you're trading with. And uh, uh, today, uh, markets have an extreme amount of data. Lately, CME's market data feeds, for example, have about 1.2 billion messages a day, and a computer is simply better equipped to keep up with message rates like that and uh, react in terms of how they're placing and uh, sizing and pricing and timing uh, orders into the market. And uh, the other key advantage is repeatability in that an algorithm is going to be predictable in how it behaves. And you can take an algorithm in a setting, use it, and have a good expectation that it's going to behave similarly over time. And you can use that to turn your execution into a scientific process where you form a hypothesis about maybe another algorithm will work better for you, another parameter to an algorithm will work better for you. Test that hypothesis, measure the outcome, and use that to adjust your settings going forward to find um, increasingly better outcomes for your trades. And uh, to uh, have an execution service that performs well, there are a few key elements. One is that a lot of the uh, math behind optimal execution and financial modeling that goes into it uh, is uh, still to a large extent um, simplifications of the real market and uh, hard to solve in a realistic and tractable way. So when you design an algorithm, there's still a lot of practical experience that goes into how to interact with the market, how to place orders, how to carve them out, and uh, doing that with a team of experienced traders who has first-hand experience with execution and the troubles that you face in different environments uh, helps make sure that your algorithm isn't blindly trading on theory, but also brings practical knowledge on how to avoid um, gaming from other market participants and how to avoid bad decisions in extreme market conditions. And another important thing is to use a high performance technology stack. If your trading is slower than your competitors, even if your order is large and you're carving it out through an entire day, that algorithm is constantly making smaller decisions on a smaller time frame in terms of when to send the next little slice of the order. And if you're making those decisions with regard to stale market data or if it's taking that order a long time to reach the market, you're going to be systematically adverse selected and miss the fills that look good and chase the market to worse prices. You're not going to be able to get out of the way of changing market conditions efficiently and you're going to have inferior placement in the queue, which increases your adverse selection on providing liquidity. And in the futures markets in particular, every product trades a little bit differently. So it's important to have a team that pays attention to the nuances of each product and how they trade. Uh, different products trade with different matching engines and have different liquidity characteristics uh, according to the seasonalities of the product and uh, how the expiration cycle for that product works. And so incorporating all that information into volume and volatility forecasts and into uh, the sizing and timing of child orders is critical. And uh, the process doesn't stop there. Once you have a well-implemented execution algorithm, different traders have different objectives and preferences for how to measure their outcomes, and it's important to collaborate to uh, improve execution over time. And uh, we wanted to start with an overview of a ex few examples of how an execution algorithm works and uh, then review uh, the outcomes that you would measure as a result. And so uh, a lot of people on this call are probably familiar with some of the basic execution algorithms out there, uh, VWAP and TWAP, uh, which trade either in line with the market's volume or uh, um, constantly over time, uh, POV, which, which trades based on the currently traded volumes rather than forecasts of how much is going to trade over time, IS implementation shortfall, which uh, trades more closer to the start of your order, close which backloads it, a uh, whole variety of algorithms to choose from and how you think about choosing an algorithm has to do with the urgency of your trade, how quickly your alpha decays, 
uh, how much market participation you anticipate um, and uh, how you're going to be measured in terms of your outcomes. And so let's take a kind of graphical look at what an algorithm might do. You can think of algorithms as being either opportunistic and liquidity seeking, where they trade uh, as much as they can when they see good opportunities in the market while still possibly trying to uh, minimize the visibility of the flow. Or you can think of an algorithm that has an objective to finish by a set time. And we think of those as being scheduled algorithms. And so a few examples of scheduled algorithms would be TWAP and VWAP, implementation shortfall and close. What we have on this graph here is a visualization of the trajectory of, uh, of a few different algorithms. In the middle, you have VWAP, and this is more or less what a VWAP execution schedule might look like for a product like an equity index. And uh, there's more volume at the start of the day, more volume at the end of the day. So uh, as a function of how much volume you complete over time, the slope of that increases at the start and the end of the day and trades a little bit slower in the afternoon when markets are expected to be quieter. And uh, the intuition behind VWAP is trade in line with the market because the faster you trade, the more you're likely to move the market to spread it out as evenly as you can over time. And uh, the risk of doing that is if you're sensitive to prices at the start of the day when you're making your decision, the longer you wait to trade, uh, the more variance there is in your outcome. The price move in your favor might move against you, but uh, you're less certain to uh, have an average fill price that represents the start of the day where you made your decision. So uh, an algorithm like implementation shortfall helps you choose a trade-off between uh, the cost of trading a little bit faster at the start of the day versus achieving more of that uh, start of day price. And so you can see by comparison, IS trades more rapidly at the start of the day. Some clients are benchmarked to uh, end of day prices. Uh, they might have an objective to minimize their tracking error versus an index. And uh, so uh, clients like those often uh, are looking to trade more actively uh, towards the close of the day or towards the end of their order if they're exiting a position in a liquidity driven trade. And so a close algorithm will shift more of its execution towards the end of the day. And uh, where a lot of the uh, microstructure magic comes in in an execution algorithm is the leeway that we give the algorithm to work around that core sort of schedule. And uh, that leeway allows us to do a variety of things. It allows us to take time to work a passive order um, and try to get a passive fill to avoid crossing the spread. And it also gives us more time to opportunistically uh, take what we see as advantageous liquidity opportunities and uh, the uh, short-lived pricing changes that occur in the data feed. And uh, there's a trade-off like everything in trading. The more leeway we take to diverge from uh, the forecasted schedule, the more variance you're going to have in your outcome from uh, that uh, VWAP price. And sometimes clients care not just about the average slippage that they incur, but also about the predictability of their results. They might have large orders that they don't send too often, and on any individual trade, they don't want too much unexpected divergence from the benchmark that they're going to be measured against. So uh, uh, there's that trade-off in variance versus um, opportunity for price improvement. And uh, then when we think about um, the different benchmarks you can use to measure whether your execution is, is good or not, uh, it all essentially comes down to sampling prices at different points in the life cycle of the trade and comparing uh, your own prices to those benchmarks. And what we have here is a graph of a stylized execution outcome. And this represents kind of an average over a very large amount of orders. Any individual order might have a very random outcome, but over time, you can think of if you're trading, um, at the time of signal gener generation, you have some expectation that the market's going to go in the way that you're trading, uh, unless you're just trading to liquidate a position, you have some sort of alpha. And there might be some sort of time interval between when you make a decision to trade and when you actually uh, send the order to your broker or start working the order yourself. And uh, that amount of time might represent making a decision based on closed prices at the end of the day and then sending the order to the market in the morning. And uh, the price drift that occurs over that period of time we think of as an opportunity cost. It's the cost of uh, not having the opportunity to start trading sooner. And then from there, you start executing. And uh, as you start executing, 
uh, what happens next is some of the price action might be uh, caused by the alpha that you're trading on, and then some of it is also caused by your own impact in the market. And often those two things are intertwined in that other people are seeing the same opportunity trading and also pushing up the market. And uh, the uh, measurement of your own impact versus just alpha can be a little bit hard to disentangle, but as a stylized view, we have this picture of the market moving up over the course of the trade and then reverting a little bit. And what happens is you are incurring some sort of temporary market impact as the market is reacting to your flow and seeing that flow is risk that there's some bigger news in the market, the market's fading versus your arrival price. And then once you stop trading, it sees that that risk of additional information is subsided and then will revert a bit. And so that reversion uh, represents a temporary market impact versus the uh, more permanent market impact that your signal and your trading activity has uh, caused to exist in the market. And uh, so uh, when we think about the benchmarks that you look in uh, transaction cost analysis products, one of the most common benchmarks to look at is your slippage versus VWAP. And so here in this chart, we have VWAP represented as this light orange line and then your own average fill price as this maroon line above it. And the idea is when you're trading aggressively, you're demanding liquidity. And on average, you're going to pay some sort of liquidity concession to the liquidity providers in the market. And your slippage from VWAP over time is going to measure essentially uh, that liquidity concession, your trading costs, and uh, the skill or lack thereof in taking advantage of short-term pricing opportunities in the market. And uh, the, any individual order might have a large amount of variance versus VWAP. It might beat VWAP, it might perform worse than VWAP, and one order to the next that's going to be driven mostly uh, by uh, whether you are actually trading in line with the volume patterns in the market in the first place. If you are trading, say, a TWAP strategy, and there is a lot of volume at the start of the order, and uh, the prices at the start of the order were great, but you didn't trade a lot at the start of the order, you're going to slip from VWAP. And uh, conversely, if the prices happen to be disadvantageous at the start of that order because you weren't trading in line with the actual volumes, it's going to distort your performance versus VWAP the other way. But uh, slippage versus VWAP tends to be a little bit less volatile than slippage from arrival price, which is a more true benchmark of your overall performance. If you take a look at how you slipped versus the price when you release the order to the market, you get a more inclusive view of uh, both your short-term uh, order placement skill and the amount that your flow has pushed the market. And uh, at the end of the day, the thing that we're seeking to do is, is move the market as little as possible by blending out the execution, employing anti-gaming techniques, and not engaging in order placement activity that will spook the other participants in the market. Another thing with measuring your slippage versus VWAP is the more actively you trade, the more that you yourself are VWAP. And uh, so it can give an underrepresentation of your true trading costs versus looking at your slippage versus arrival price. Uh, slippage versus arrival price is, is very hard to game, and what you'll typically see is the more volume participation you incur, the higher your slippage. Another important part about transaction cost analysis is looking at the relationship between your arrival price slippage and how actively you're trading and making sure that on that range of participation rates, your, uh, your slippage versus arrival is fair. Another thing to monitor is slippage versus post-trade prices to uh, get a sense of how much temporary impact you're causing versus permanent impact. Uh, if you have a large amount of temporary impact versus permanent impact, uh, it might be a sign that you are spoofing the market in an unnecessary way. And uh, then uh, another thing that, that you can do uh, with these uh, sort of transaction costs um, statistics is look at other things like the percentage of time that you're taking liquidity versus providing liquidity, how that's influenced by your participation rates, and also uh, whether there's a big difference in how often you're taking liquidity if you're buying into the trend versus trading against the trend. All things being equal, we're essentially trying to trade in line with the market, and if we're struggling to keep up and having to consistently cross the spread to keep up on the execution schedule, it's um, a sign that, that the algorithm might not 
to be uh, reacting to uh, live fare prices as well as it should be. And uh, so at the end of the day, you have a lot of metrics, a lot of different price comparison points. You can also look at your slippage versus um, uh, uh, volume weighted prices, uh, participation weighted prices, if you had participated at hypothetical different rates. So let's say you were 3% of the market, you can see what would the volume weighted average price have been if I had spread out my order to only trade 1% of the market, or spread it up to trade 5% of the market, and benchmarks like that can also give you insight into whether you should be trading faster or slower. But it's important to measure these over time because uh, any individual order can be favorable or disadvantageous, and having a large sample of data helps give confidence in the numbers. And uh, using a tool like OneTix Transaction Cost Analysis product also gives you the ability, which is critical to group your uh, transaction costs on different metrics and have a flexible way to slice and dice the numbers so that you can uh, ask questions about, well, in this group of orders or in this product, how uh, do my numbers look? Is there uh, an algorithm that's working particularly well for me in this market environment versus that? And uh, at this point, I'll turn over the presentation to Louis so he can go into more in depth about the tools to uh, measure and monitor transaction cost over time. Hi, David. Thanks. Thanks for that. Hi, everyone. Um, again, my name is Louis Lovis, and I'm going to talk a little bit, um, uh, maybe a little broader and in some cases a little deeper regarding uh, transaction cost analysis from pick, kind of picking up where David left off, you know, so he kind of kicked off talking about execution algos in the futures market and just sort of covering all the different bases relative to the, the whys and the the value and the benefit around execution algos. And of course, you know, what that leads to is David was sort of introducing there is, is how do you measure them? Um, and when it comes to that, you know, this idea of, of uh, understanding TCA and impact analysis um, is really rooted deep in the fact that um, in our industry, there's an ever increasing use of new technology and technology in general and it's really causing this sort of transformation in how firms operate. It is, of course, behind the accelerating use of algorithms, which was the first part of what David was talking about, the accelerating use of algorithms or the use of algorithms in, in the futures market. But in general, it does create a more competitive environment for everyone. And I'm sure many are faced with this and the thinning margins and the diminished volumes and the uncertainty in measuring, accurately measuring returns. Um, and this, of course, leads to the pressure to use algorithms even more as you look to squeeze alpha out of that diminishing pot. And, of course, the direct consequence of this is insight into that order execution performance of those algorithms and how to measure it. <clears throat> and, and, of course, using and leveraging some of that same technology that is used to build algorithms, build that execution uh, logic is also used to build um, TCA. Um, and achieving that sort of best execution really means understanding slippage and market impact of that order execution. Every trade has an impact on the market. This is a function of available liquidity, order size and duration. Liquid markets can absorb the impact of trading without incurring heavy costs. And the te techniques to discover and measure that impact can have a direct consequence on trading behaviors. Over the past several years, TCA has been making headline news across the industry. I'm sure that you've seen this both in the trade journals and firms and vendors that are offering TCA solutions. And measuring and understanding trade costs has been a source of alpha <clears throat> and has come into focus as firms have a clear desire to get a better handle on their returns. TCA's goal is to measure and analyze the factors that affect the price of an order and what it is executed at. It is an ongoing feedback loop to measure trading costs so that they can be reduced for the express purpose of protecting and preserving alpha. That feedback loop is a continuous cycle to identify inefficiencies so improvements can be made in trading styles 
algorithm logic, algorithm parameters to those algorithms, and of course the algorithm aggressiveness. Firms across the industry are using and demanding the same automation technology used for TCA analysis. And why is this happening? An expanding use of execution algorithms. And I did mention, of course, the purpose of what we're trying to describe here is that these execution algorithms are now being played out in outside of equities into the futures market. And that's sort of the purpose of what we're trying to describe here. <clears throat> their ever-increasing sophistication in an effort to capture liquidity and preserve alpha. And of course, this notion of consolidation of cross-trading desks for different asset classes. Uh, traders and PMs want to use the same tools, the same technology across assets and markets to get a more complete and consistent picture of costs across, across all their tradable markets. And of course, to leverage in-house quant expertise. So being able to quantify executions and measure how well they perform against benchmarks is not new, but the tools and technology to provide this are now becoming common in all asset craft classes. The three core technologies behind this are data management, analytics, and visualization. TCA demands a precise view of market data, whether end-of-day analysis, intraday, or real-time historical content, along with streaming real-time prices, play a vital role to establish benchmarks. And that data has to be consolidated, coalesced, time-aligned for accurate reflection of market prices to create reliable benchmarks. Quants and portfolio managers have an interest in how costs affect decisions. Analysis of trade executions is necessarily complex and involves comparison of execution prices across a variety of benchmarks. And the three primary drivers of cost analysis are market participation, market impact, and implementation shortfall. And David sort of alluded to all three of those, except why they're important. And these are all implicit costs. They represent the invisible part of transaction costs, consisting of slippage. You know, the typical slippage model is an implementation shortfall. And it's really, you know, are the execution al algorithms trading below market benchmarks? <clears throat> market impact is due to the aggressive nature of filling an order and cost from lost opportunity from unfilled portions of an order. The third component in this TCA technology stack is visualization. The front end data grids and plotted results to see benchmarks, see performance metrics in a human readable format. Visual displays simplify that comprehension of that data and promote an understanding and insight and most importantly, offer clues to spot outliers. Regarding benchmarks, many benchmarks, and this is a similar chart to what David had on his slide here, it's just a little bit more interactive so you can kind of see a little bit more visually where some of these benchmarks occur. And some are known as point in time benchmarks, such as the open close and arrival price. Others are more dynamic, consisting of interval metrics for an order's duration, the trading day, or a period or an interval used to measure both slippage and market impact. Metrics include VWAP, of course, effective spread and, and volume participation rates. The main challenge in TCA is to determine a trade price is high or low given market conditions at the time the order was processed. One way to determine that is to measure market impact. That consists, consists of comparing multiple price points, the arrival price and order's completion price, as well as the price an order was completed. Every trade has an impact on the market, regardless of the size, is going to incur a cost simply by its presence. Market impact is one of the more costly components that can affect order performance. Triggered by aggressiveness, an order can generate adverse price movement. It is a price to pay for consuming liquidity beyond the best quote. To complete large orders, buyers must pay premium prices and sellers must offer discounts. The supply-demand imbalance forces market prices to less favorable conditions. 
One way to improve order performance is by reducing market impact. Stealth algorithms, like the ones David was describing, you can categorize them as stealth algorithms, were devised for this very purpose, and they are the outgrowth of market pressures, that imbalance created by other participants' ability to detect order flow, and now that sophistication has become the norm in the industry. Um, to follow up with David's discussion on these execution algorithms and uh, that little introduction uh, to TCA, um, I'm going to show a few kind of screenshots here of this sort of post-trade review of, and basic analysis of um, uh, VWAP and TWAP strategies. And of course, here in this, as you can see, they're trading um, the E-minis, the Treasury notes, and the dollar Euro-dollar futures. This is a screenshot. I just sort of cut a screenshot of our, our TCA solution dashboard. I have a few of them to show organized into three groups. The order detail, the relevant market benchmarks, oops, sort of individually, and then lastly, how to combine those things to compute and look at order performance metrics. So on this one, this is really talking about sort of the relative uh, data points or metrics really coming from orders, obviously starting with the security, you know, what strategy was executed, that was a buyer sell order, how big that order was. This VWAP is the interval VWAP. Essentially, it is a computed value of all the executions behind this order. Um, and that then is used as sort of the relative measure when we start looking and comparing it to benchmarks. And of course, the size of the order as well. Speed of execution is duration. So you can look at this in terms of, I want to spot outliers or look for outliers or plot outliers relative to a number of metrics. Um, it can be performance things. You can look at long, very long running orders. You can look at orders of a particular size. Um, they all indicate sort of um, outlier, potential outlier conditions. On the other side of it, you know, the first side of it, of the left-hand side of the equation is the order information. The right-hand side is the actual market, right? So the market is, um, again, we're looking at this relative to orders by ID, by contract and ID. Um, so for that strategy, we're going to compa eventually compare that interval VWAP to um, both the full market VWAP, um, a market interval VWAP, and TWAP. Um, and this allows us to then say, compare how well we've done in the market with that particular strategy with whether parameter settings relative to defining its aggressiveness in the market. And then lastly, I'm going to show some of these here. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Again, what I'm showing here is just three screenshots, the order detail, the market benchmarks, and then the order performance metrics that are derived from that order detail and market benchmarks to essentially indicate how well um, strategies execute in order, essentially that order performance. And mm -hmm. um, there's a few key fields that, that I have listed here. Um, some David mentioned as well, essentially things around slippage, otherwise known as implementation shortfall. Um, Again, this is relative to the security, the strategy itself. These two, ETQ, is known as effective to quoted spread, and it's really a, a metric targeted for small order um, uh, analysis, essentially the instantaneous price impact of small orders. Most of, or I think most of, or all of these uh, execution algos uh, trade quite a few uh, over a fairly long duration, as you saw on that speed of execution on the previous slide, and also have quite a few at fills or executions to go along with that order. But ATQ, as, as you can vary how an execution algo uh, operates, if it is a small price, you can look at things that are more relevant to small order, I'm sorry, small order, uh, immediate at fill kind of models. And this ETQ is actually a pretty good indication of that, so small negative numbers here indicate executions inside the spread and then are getting a pretty decent price improvement. Uh, the next three, um, all relative to, or computed in basis points, these are all slippage metric, metrics against common market benchmarks. Um, the market price at the um, timestamp of the order's entry or arrival, so, so this is comparing uh, the order execution to the arrival price. 
is comparing the order execution to an order, you know, the equivalent interval for both VWAP, a standard market VWAP, and a standard market TWAP. Um, positive large values here imply good execution, while large negative numbers are a sign of poor execution. It's possible to see this in this very granular view, which I'm showing because this is showing this data on a per order basis. But typically, if they you know any sort of uh, agency or firm that's offering the executions out to buy side firms, they want to see a roll up, right? So they want to see the aggregation and that sort of overall performance, not just at a specific order, but maybe by a strategy. That's a very common metric or even by a traded product. How well did I do trading this product, you know, e-minis with a VWAP strategy, with a TWAP strategy? In the screenshot, I'm just showing that uh, fair amount of extreme detail because it's on a per order by order ID basis. Um, and then lastly, the last field I want to point out here is relative to market impact. This is a, a, a measurement of that impact. I'm not sort of trying to define whether it's permanent or temporary, only what it is, right? And this is really at a fixed interval. Um, the conventional wisdom on market impact analysis is really typically the duration of the order. So it's somewhat variable, but in this case, this is a fixed interval. So at the time of the last fill, we then, because we're doing a post-trade analysis here, we can sort of fast forward 30 minutes after that and see what was the um, movement in the market. Um, and this is typically known as reversion. And it is a measurement of that impact on the trade on the market and how the market reverts afterwards. In practice, you know, the larger the trade, the more impact it has on the market. Okay, last I just want to say this was a brief introduction to the analysis provided by OneTix TC8 platform. It does offer many other benchmarks too numerous to mention in a, a quick overview here. Um, and we offer that uh, many benchmarks, many performance metrics, and it's actually pretty easy to add your own. You can customize this thing quite well um, to add um, uh, additional types of metrics that you'd be interested in seeing. Of course, plotting those and aggregating those as well. Okay, um, that's all I have to um, Say, and let me hand it back to Brad. Um, we can do a little wrap up and see if there's any questions. So, Brad? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Louie and David. Yeah, give me one second here. We'll share my screen. Wait, uh, Louie, you got to pass the ball. Yes. All right, guys. So, uh, so yeah, thanks, Louie and David, for uh, for uh, for those presentations. Uh, so now uh, we would like to uh, give everybody a chance to uh, for for Q and A. Uh, we have a question. Is this a uh, is this deployed or hosted solution? David, you want to take that? Sure. So um, I'll answer from the algos themselves and let Louie answer about the TCA uh, solution. For the algorithms, we uh, do two things. One for execution algorithms, it's uh, they run on servers that. RCM operates, and uh, it's um, essentially an execution service where you place an order via uh, uh, execution management system, uh, so a trading front end of your choice. 
and uh, then uh, the uh, logic of the algorithms works behind the scenes co-located at a data center near the exchange and uh, you can place the order through a trading screen or through a standard fixed connection and then um, uh, we monitor all the servers and the data feeds and monitor the execution quality and help advise uh, which algorithms are uh, suitable for your trading style. Yeah, from the TCA side, yeah, we actually offer the solution in both a hosted or locally deployed on-premises, and it's really a function of um, the firm. So in our our relationship with our CMX, yes, they offer, we offer it in a hosted solution and within, you know, one of the standard data centers, NY4, I think. But um, we, we, in terms of overall deployments, we do offer this in, in sort of both solutions because we have clients who have their own connectivity. They want to leverage their own uh, feed adapters. Um, they want to leverage or have a direct connection to their um, OMS or EMS and whatever source of market data they have. Great, we have another question. Uh, where does the market data come from for the benchmarks? I guess it's more of a TCA related question, given the fact that it's about benchmarks. Um, I just alluded to it just a moment ago. So we offer, as a, a vendor, One Market Data offers both the technology platform uh, targeted solutions like TCA. Um, best execution and trade surveillance, but we also are a data vendor. Um, we have for um, historical data um, across the global futures market, so not just you know within the U.S. with the CME and ICE, but also over um, European um, exchanges, Eurex, and in Asia as well. Um, but you know, many firms have already have an in-house. Uh, feed. They already want to try to leverage that because they already have relationships with the various exchanges. So yes, we can also take advantage of that as well. So we're not like exclusively locked into our own source of market data. Uh, we just try to make it easy for our customers that the only thing they really need to supply to us is their order flow. Um, and then we can easily plumb that into our uh, both our solution and our existing source of market data. Great, we have another question. Uh, how do we see regulation impacting TCA? So uh, there's definitely been a trend uh, in both official regulation and uh, um, unofficial regulatory scrutiny in terms of best execution practices and uh, um, having uh, written procedures and controls to make sure that execution is being uh, monitored and uh, done in a way that is beneficial to uh, the end client of the flow is, is, uh, has always been important, but um, uh, I think the trend is going to be for that to be more formalized and having good policies in place for data retention and measurement and periodic review is, is critical to doing that well. All right, great. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, just please take the time to, to complete our post-webinar survey. Um, we will notify you when the webinar recording is available. And just a heads up as, uh, as a notification for some upcoming webinars on November 1st, Fast Cheat State of the Art, Finding Alpha Using Cloud Data, Python, and Streaming Analytics. And November 8th, Deep Dive, Optimizing Execution Quality Using Cloud, Data, Python, and Streaming Analytics. So with that, uh, we'll conclude our webinar today. We want to thank everybody for joining us, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing everybody the next time. Have a great day, everybody.